Hello and welcome to slide review. So today we're going back to germ three non-melanocytic lesions to go over the challenge cases that were presented at the end. Um, so first we're going to go over our standard disclaimer that we always show. And again, like with previous lectures, previous uh, challenge case videos, if you have questions about this or, or anything else, please feel free to add that to the comments. Um, you can send messages to either of the Twitter accounts. Um, and we really love hearing uh, feedback from everybody, whether it's trying to improve audio, video, or even things that you'd like to see in different videos, things that helped you, things that you thought maybe could have been better. Um, but because the focus of this video is to go over the challenge cases. We're not going to go over this lecture again. Um, it's all within the same presentation, but we will have a link in the description for the original video as well as the whole slide images on path presenters so that you can take a look at those. And there's a lot of cases today, as you can see, so we're going to go very, very quickly. Um, and yeah, 21 cases. Okay, so let's let's do this. Case one. So first thing we notice is that there's something definitely going on in the dermis. Um, it's, it's really blue, but there's something also going on in the epidermis. Okay, so I'm gonna focus in on this piece. And what we see here is that we have these big polygonal uh, cells, this is, acanthosis or epidermal hyperplasia. Um, the nuclei, however, unlike some of the lesions that we saw in the lecture and we'll see today, the nuclei are very central. There is maturation where we start off with um, our basal layer. So here's our basal layer down here. It can be hard to appreciate because it's, it's very uh, relatively pink compared to all the cellularity in the dermis, um, but the cells have central nuclei, they have uh, relatively open vesicular looking chromatin. There are some nucleoli, but they're not really that prominent. And we have all this perikeratosis, okay? So we see the flattened nuclei, but this is all perikeratosis. Granular layer is present, but maybe somewhat diminished. Let's see if we can, like here the basal layer, this is this is more normal where we can see that definite basal layer, um, very blue, nicely arranged keratinocytes, and then you see how we have maturation going up the granular layer and then in the, this area we don't have that perikeratosis okay we have orthokeratosis here where it has that basket weave pattern and we'll get to the dermis i know some of you are probably going ah why is she skipping over the dermis well let's just see if we can find some of the other features in the epidermis that relate to this condition first I don't know if we'll see one of them, but whoops. Okay, so not really appreciating them. Um, but this can also often will involve uh, hair follicles, okay, and adnexa. Um, not overly appreciating any. There's a, a lot that's going on in the dermis though, and that can be somewhat obscuring. So what is happening? in the dermis is that we have a lot of macrophages, okay? And uh, then this relatively chronic, it is somewhat mixed, but it's, it's predominantly lymphoplasmacytic inflammation surrounding these areas of macrophages. Uh, so don't be fooled, this is epidermis. Okay, and epidermis in, in these type of lesions uh, can go very deep. Like we can see how it's still nesting very close to the ink. But the key is that the epidermis never, ever, ever, and we hardly ever say never in pathology, but it never involves subcutis. Okay, so even though it can have irregular acanthosis, it should never involve the subcutis. And we don't see subcutis because that would be like our, our fiber adipose. Um, 
but we can see how this is really irregular. Um, and this inflammation in the dermis, this granulomatous inflammation is uh, really um, obscuring the actual pathology that we're trying to showcase here. So we have a granulomatous dermatitis in addition to pseudoepitheliomatous hyperplasia. So that's what this is. This is pseudoepitheliomatous hyperplasia. We didn't cover that in the lecture, but it is present in the handout on, uh, in table nine. You'll see that there's uh, pseudoepitheliomatous hyperplasia compared against toker cell hyperplasia. Um, so that's what this is. Case two, two cuts of the same thing. We can already see here's part of our pathology, but we definitely have some acanthosis of the epidermal layer, and the dermis, at least at this power, looks relatively spared. So let's go in. And hopefully this is a pattern that everyone's getting used to. So we have our epidermal layer is relatively basophilic, and we have these little things hanging out. This one, so here, even though this technically fits because it's keratin, um, what doesn't necessarily fit is the fact that you can see where it opens up to the surface. So <laughs> a little bit of a soft binding, but this is much better. Um, so if we go in, you know, that's as high as we can go. Um, but what we see is we have the cystic space with this onion skinning type uh, keratin in there. Uh, so this is a pseudohorn cyst. And if you go through, we won't spend a whole lot of time, but what you're going through at that point looking at in the epidermis is, is there any atypia? Again, more of those pseudohorn cysts. So this is a relatively straightforward case of seborrheic keratosis. Um, the fact that the epidermis is really basophilic can um, make this somewhat challenging. However, there really isn't significant atypia. There is like um, some glycogenation. So those are the little um, like halo-y type areas. And there is some spongiosis, but remember that can also be artifact. Um, but this is a, an SK, a seborrheic keratosis. Remember, coin-like stuck on appearance. Case three, so it looks like we have two pieces, same cut, and kind of the same thing going on. So let's just take a look. We have this really prominent acanthosis. Again, with this in case, as we saw in some of the cases in, in our lecture, the granular layers looks a little more eosinophilic, maybe than uh, basophilic. You can tell it definitely stands out and it's in the correct place. We do have some tangential sectioning, sorry. Um, again, as well as some spongiosis. Let's see, and this is really good for pseudohorn cysts here. Again, we have our basal layer is intact. And even though the the Squamous cells look a little funny. They have more of a reactive appearance, where again, the chromatin is a little more vesicular. Um, the nuclear membranes are still like they're round. We do have some nucleoli uh, and pseudohorn cysts. So this is another example of separate keratosis, case four. So it looked like either this was lifted off of our case or, but this is our piece of interest. Um, let's try and orient. So what looks like what happened is it's kind of flipped around. So, oh, no, we don't want 360. But this is a nice feature with uh, the path presenter where you can rotate the pieces if you find that's a little easier. So here we have our epidermal layer. And look at all this uh, perikeratosis. Um, but we have these very like papillary type acanthosis and that granular layer, all this red, this is super prominent uh, granular layers, at least that's what it looks like right now. We'll take a, a closer look at it. A 
what we unfortunately are not seeing, oh, here's a little bit of it, is the steepling. So we have the um, parakeratosis and we have some orthokeratosis. Okay, so I'm happy with that. Um, some of the other things that we're looking at. Ah, okay, I see what these are. So this is not necessarily granular layer. These are, oh, and I'm going to butcher the name again. Whew. Uh, so we have uh, keratohyaline, <laughs> keratohyaline, hyaline. I can smell it, I can't say it. Um, but these are the granules associated with uh, Bruca vulgaris, okay? Um, and how do we know this is Bruca? Well, besides the that uh, steepling effect with the perichoritosis and acanthosis, here's our halos that we were expecting. Again, you see more of the, the granules. Um, other things that we were talking about in our lectures uh, were things like Hemorrhage, well, I don't really see hemorrhage in the corneal layer. Like there's a little bit of serum here. Um, it's hard to tell if there's intoing. And intoing, remember, is uh, the edges of the lesion point towards the middle. Like maybe it's doing it a little bit here, but I think that's kind of hard to tell. Um, we do have the halos. We do have the uh, inclusions. Again, not really seeing a whole heck of a lot of inflammation. But like all these granules, these basophilic granules. Um, let's see if we can find any mitotic figures because that will also make us feel maybe a little more confident. Remember, the, the mitotic activity should still be at the basal or layer. Um, it's just because you have this undulating or papillary pattern that makes it somewhat difficult to. Uh, tell what you're looking at. Okay, well, not seeing any super obvious mitotic figures. Maybe one here. I can't zoom in any higher. Fortunately, that looks like one there too. It's right on the edge though. Um, but yeah, this is definitely a Veruca. So this is Veruca vulgaris. Um, but if you want a nice example of the intracorneal hemorrhage, uh, the case that we talked about in lecture is really nice for that. Case five, again, we have multiple cuts of the same tissue, so we're just going to go here. And here we see more classic, right? Here's this papillary um, architecture. Um, we have a little bit of intoing where it looks like it's being pulled towards the center of the lesion. And it looks like we have steepling, but let's take a closer look. And we do. So you can see how we have this layering of the perikeratosis over top of these papillary areas. We have intracorneal hemorrhage. We're going through, look at all those vacuoles. Like, isn't like that just really stands out? And even if you, if we go back to like a lower power, you can see how you can appreciate that. But at low power, you wouldn't want to necessarily call that right away because you want to make sure that's not part of the artifact that maybe you're seeing around here. Um, but we can definitely tell that those are, uh, those are our vacuoles. And then here we have the granules. So I think the granules are a little easier maybe to see in this case because you, you can see how basophilic those are. Um, let's see if we have any real mitotic activity. And again, we're just going to go super quick. Um, there's not really a whole heck of a lot of inflammation going on. But remember, you don't have to have inflammation. You don't have to have the mitotic figures. It's just if you do see them, they should be at the basal layer. I'm not really appreciating it. But this is another Bruca vulgaris. This almost looks like it's binucleated, maybe. Um, okay, so I'm happy with this. But this is Bruca vulgaris, case five. This is case six. So this looks acanthotic, but relatively um, blase compared to all this stuff, right? So here is intoing. 
So even at low power, we can see how the edges of the lesion are being pulled toward the center. So some of you probably know where we're going already. Here's our stapling, where it's piled on top of these papillary structures. Uh, it, this is somewhat overstained. Um, so there is a little bit of serum. Pockets I'm seeing, not so much. Hemorrhage, but that's okay. Um, doesn't mean it doesn't fit, right? Uh, we still have our perinuclear halos. You can see that there are the granules. We have a prominent granular layer. And that's kind of it. So this is, this is again, well, I guess maybe we have a little more inflammation in the dermis that we haven't seen in previous cases, but it, it's not really too prominent. Um, if we go over here, there's a little bit of hemorrhage, but it's on the surface. And again, uh, the, the characteristic finding is intra intracorneal. Here we have nice dilated vessels within the pap the uh, dermal papillae. So again, these finger-like projections are going up and they're dilated, they're filled with red cells. So this again is a classic Veruca vulgaris. Okay, and then these areas we have, uh, there's a little bit of maybe acanthosis, but this is orthokeratosis. You see that basket weave pattern of the keratin. Case seven. So this already looks a little different from what we've seen in the previous couple cases. Uh, the, the tissue looks relatively thin and two different cuts. So let's just go through. And we see maybe a little bit of serum crusting. Looks like we probably have some perikeratosis. I can already pick out some nuclei. And there's already a little bit of disarray. A little more here, but this is falling apart, so I can make it more difficult to uh, try and figure out. And here we start seeing like it, it looks like we at least have like uh, multiple nucleoli. in our cells. Um, this just has a really funny appearance to it. So let's maybe try going to the other piece, seeing if we fare any better there. This looks somewhat disordered. Um, not much, but there, there is some degree of disorder to this. Uh, this looks maybe a little better here. Better for disorder. Let's see if the other section, oh, okay. Decide to load and here. You can't say too much because again, like it's a very superficial biopsy, so you can't really see what's going on with those layers. But this is just, it's unusual because this looks normal. Okay, so we have these relatively extensive areas that have these enlarged cells with some like mild, some could more argue maybe even moderate atypia. Um, they don't look really reactive uh, because a lot of them still have relatively closed on that unfortunately is as high as we can go in um but i'm still seeing fairly smooth nuclear contours but like these nuclei are they're too big they're too high up um this is our granular layer so we really shouldn't be seeing those kind of features that high up there should be some sense of maturity and this just has like a really funny feel to it um, 
So a low degree of atypia, but even a low degree of atypia can be enough for actinic keratosis. Let's just see if maybe we have a little better in the other layer. And all this stuff that's kind of falling apart is just, like, this is just too atypical. Like, why do we have this big cell here? Um, this is a dyskeratotic cell, looks like, maybe. Just because it's so pink. Um, but these things don't, don't belong, so they don't fit. This is atypia, and that makes this actinic keratosis subtle. Um, even though it looks funny, like this is kind of falling apart. So it's like, ah, how much do I want to say about that? But um, this is key seven. So actinic keratosis. Case eight. Wow. Look at all that keratin. So at first glance, you might think, okay, well, are we looking at some other type of Veruca? Because Veruca always has this hyperkeratosis. But remember, we're... Um, we don't really see the, the papillary structures, um, the stacking, we're not seeing the nuclear uh, halos. But again, there, there's some degree of disarray going on here. atypical this is binucleated and we see how far up this is from the basal layer this is atypical so we're at least at actinic keratosis okay you can't have that here's another one <laughs> um, so we start seeing just more and more atypical cells um, but it's still again relatively low degree atypia and then this massive amount of parakeratosis like look at this it just goes all the way up um so let's just make sure again like look at this way too atypical so this is an actinic keratosis there's nothing here to suggest that this is like a carcinoma in situ um, but this is a variant of actinic keratosis uh, that, not surprisingly, is called the hyperkeratotic type. Um, so it is characterized by having like this really prominent uh, parakeratosis. Um, and it can even look like it's uh, almost like psoriasis sometimes. Um, this one has parakeratosis, but you can have just like uh, like an orthokeratosis as well. Um, they do talk about uh, dermal fibrosis. I don't know that's really that prominent in this case. Like there's a lot of solar elastosis here. Um, but I think the epidermal features are enough. I don't think you need to rely on that. Um, but again, if you saw something that looked very fibrotic and scarred and maybe some like more dense collagen bundles then maybe um, you'd be thinking like okay is this either like an AK like a hypertrophic AK or is this really like a, a, a lichen simplex chronicus type picture okay so this is actinkeratosis hyperkeratotic type case nine so again we have two levels of the relatively similar looking appearance. We have looks like some relatively extensive dermal uh, inflammation. And the epidermis is dark, but we're not really seeing like that uh, prominent keratin or parakeratosis that we saw before. But again, binucleation looks like. I think this is probably like a, a lymphocyte that came up where it has that squiggly look. As always, there, there is some degree of spongiosis. And these again, just like binucleated, really high up. This is atypia, okay? Um, so even though this isn't super acanthotic like we've seen in others, this is atypical. 
Okay, and again, we have variation in the cell size, cell shape. That looks like a, a mitotic figure. And we see how high up that is in the epidermis. Like your, your mitotic figure should never be above like the first like three cell layers. Okay, um, so that's way too high up. So this is a type of actinic keratosis. And this form of actinic keratosis is characterized by this super prominent, dense, lympho lymphocytic dermal infiltrate. Excuse me. Um, and it's always present in the superficial dermis, but this is a very superficial biopsy, so maybe that's a little hard to appreciate, but um, it's just so dense. And then you have this little bit of AK in it. Um, the vacuoles because you can also have like um these might fit like the, there's basilar vacuolization uh in this type of ak but it's kind of hard to tell like this is definitely enough for me to push the ak um and yeah, this is maybe a little better basilar vacuolization um, and you can have uh, dyskeratotic cells as well, which is uh, way too big to be an EO, so maybe this is a dyskeratotic cell. Um, but you can see that in these lesions as well. So this is uh, actin keratosis lichenoid type. And again, all these subtypes of lesions are um, within the handout itself. This is case 10. So again, this looks relatively similar to our Baruga. It looks like it has some intoing. And if we go in, what we see looking at this is a lot, a lot of keratin. We have this very eosinophilic uh, acanthosis that's somewhat irregular. Um, like it, it really has like more of like an infiltrative look, which this lesion can have. Um, and there is a, a, some etypia, but again, like appreciating how large these cells are, how densely eosinophilic they are. Um, this one's binucleated, but we can see these super prominent nucleoli within them. Uh, we do have some dyskeratosis, like look at those uh, apoptotic bodies. Um, there will be inflammation associated with this as well. Oh, there we go, we found it. Um, so lots of plasma cells. Again, our plasma cells have those eccentric nuclei. We have the tails, um, clock face chromatin, which again, this is as high as we can go on this, but lots and lots of plasma cells. Um, often with this, what you should see for inflammation will be eosinophils as well as neutrophils. Um, but just, yeah, a lot of plasma cells with this, which does not alter what we're going to call this. Look at that mitotic figure. Yikes. Scary. Lots of mitotic figures. Um, so what this is is a uh, keratoacanthoma or KA or Ka as we were talking about in the lecture. Um, and again, these are like your sometimes referred to as your well differentiated, but you can really appreciate the eosinophilia in within the lesion itself compared to just the acanthotic epidermis that is not involved. This one has an infiltrative edge, which they can have. Um, Usually they have more of like a, a pushing type border, but this one has more of an infiltrative type edge. Okay. So this is keratoacanthoma. Case 11. So we see somewhat of the same picture. We have this nice uh, adnexa right beside the lesion. Um, but at first glance, it really doesn't look as eosinophilic as the previous one. However, again, if we compare to the more basophilic um, look of the epidermis over here, where it's a little more normal, this is more eosinophilic. 
Uh, looks like maybe we do have some, well, these look dyskeratotic here. There is a tibia. Maybe that's, I'm trying to see if we have a good example that has uh, eosinophils and neutrophils, um, but it's really the lesion itself that is a little more characteristic than necessarily the, the inflammation around it. Uh, like that maybe is a neutrophil. It's a lot of solar elastosis in the background here. That looks like an eosinophil. And it's hard because there's a lot of these capillaries that have red cells in them. So you wanna um, be careful in what you're calling eosinophil versus red cell versus extravasated red cell. Um, but again, this has more of like a chronic inflammation type look than than predominantly neutrophils and eosinophils. But either way, we still have this atypia that uh, is consistent with like a well-differentiated carcinoma, um, but it's in this, again, craterous type lesion. It has a somewhat infiltrative edge again. This is another example of keratoacanthoma. I just wish maybe some of the features were a little more prominent, but again, uh, these are nice examples to go over because, you know, differentiating this from like a, a true uh, invasive squame, um, because again, in, invasive squamous, we want surgical excision versus like keratoacanthoma, a lot of these will spontaneously regress, okay? So huge differences in uh, what you really want to do surgically and stuff like that for the patient. So you want to be sure keratoacanthoma versus squamous cell carcinoma. But this is a keratoacanthoma. Moving on to case 12. Um, so at low power, it looks like there's a piece here that was not selected for scanning. Um, but we start seeing like this bubbly appearance within the epidermis. The dermis itself looks relatively bland. Superficial dermis probably has some inflammation. And we're just gonna zoom in and kind of see what these bubbles look like. And what we see is that we do have these clear cells, these vacuolated cells. Um, that have these nuclei, which are relatively large, they're round. Um, maybe vesicular, they don't look coarse, but um, it's really hard to tell because this, again, is as high as you can zoom in and you can see that the quality uh, of the scan is somewhat deteriorating a little bit. Um, so maybe they didn't intend for uh, the scan to be focused as at, a, at such a high power. Um, and so not just the clear cells, but you also wanna look at these cells that kind of have almost like this uh, fluffy look where the, the cytoplasm is really pale, but it's still there. And all these cells have relatively round nuclei. Um, they look very similar to each other. There's some size variation, right? But they're all potatoes, like we've talked about potatoes versus gourds. Um, let's see here. So we have, there's a dyskeratotic cell. Um, but really, the, the cell focus is these larger cells. Like these are not keratinocytes, these are actually Paget cells. All of these cells with these uh, clear to fluffy or pale cytoplasm. Um, and they're, rel they're becoming relatively confluent. What you can appreciate, actually this is a nice area, is that we have them in the base, but then they're scattered throughout the epidermis. The case that we had within the lecture was just so showing you confluent, um, like 
sheets and sheets of these Paget cells that had just completely taken over the epidermis. Um, so this is probably maybe a little more of an earlier lesion than a late lesion. Um, don't really... see too much else going on here. There is some uh, lymphocytic dermal invasion, which you can see inflammation, um, but remember you can also have a degree, somewhat of a degree of, of dermal inflammation present normally. This is a bit too much. And it looks like it's mostly peri perivascular superficial dermis. Um, and this lesion does not look invasive. It looks like it's confined to the epidermal layer. So this is extra mammary Paget's disease or EMPD. Case 13. So this looks like we have acanthotic squamous uh, tissue. And we have like all these atypical cells. There's no real order to what's going on here. Look at that mitotic figure, it's really high up. Um, and there's some dyskeratotic cells all over, another mitotic figure, but that's basilar. This is an abnormal mitotic figure. Again, apoptotic bodies. Wow, look at this one. It almost looks like, like caput medusae or something like that, like the, the snake heads coming out from the, the tail of Perseus. Um, but very atypical, it's involving the entire breadth of the epidermis, okay? We're, we're, we don't worry about the parakeratosis that's overlying it, even though it's not uncommon to have parakeratosis over top, um, right? Like often we expect if you have this diffuse parakeratosis, let's check out what else is going on in the epidermis. And we can see that it uncovers like the entire area. And this is actually really great because what you see is here's the end of the lesion, right? We have all this atypia and then boom, this is normal epidermis. So what we have here, and uh, we can quickly go to the other piece, uh, and same issue we had in the lecture. This is uh, squamous cell carcinoma in situ, also known as Bowen disease. Uh, here's our ink. Now, even though we have some epidermis missing here, we can see that there's ink as high as up as, as it'll let me go, but this is ink at the lesion. And again, these are very superficial, say, shave biopsies. Um, in these kind of instances, they would go back and most likely, uh, if they if it's somewhere like on the arm leg back they would do an excision if this is like on the face they're going to do that slow mos surgery to try and minimize scarring so this is squamous cell carcinoma in situ case 14. so again we see this really prominent acanthosis in all three sections and probably some parakeratosis but let's just take a look really intense dermal inflammation and this is just a whole mess of unhappy squamous cells. Um, what we're looking at is, look at all these dyskeratotic cells. Uh, there's no real organization to the cells. They're, they're really haphazardly placed. Um, it's maybe not as pleomorphic as the previous case. Um, but the whole arrangement to this is just off, and it is, uh, again, somewhat overstained, which is difficult, but this doesn't belong, and it's way too much, way too much. And we start seeing these cells are just, they're up in the granular layer. Some vacuolated cells, so um, it is possible that maybe this is involving like a Veruca, which, Things can you can win, you can win the lottery twice, as I always say, and you can win the the wrong lottery twice. Um, but this is too much atypia. It's going again, involving all layers of the epidermis, lots of dyskeratotic cells. 
and this really, really prominent superficial dermal inflammation. Uh, again, looks mostly lymphocytic, and we have this um, basal or solar elastosis. So again, this looks like a case of squamous cell carcinoma in situ, but let's take a look at the last piece because maybe, maybe I'll show us um, that the ink. This, actually this slide section probably looks a little better than the other ones for really showing the, the full, the full thickness atypia. Um, the cells are just going all the way up. They're way too big. Again, there's, there's no degree of order to any of this. Um, so this is squamous cell carcinoma in situ. Like, look at that. Way too much. Um, squamous cell carcinoma in situ. Case 15. So again, we have two <laughs> sections of the same. And okay, I don't know how much time I need to spend on this because even at this power, or maybe even a little lower, we can see the squames, okay, the squamous epithelium, and we can see this downward growth. And as we talked about in the lecture, when you have downward growth, and it's not tangential because we can see that this is correctly placed, and you can see the epidermis and where, where this attaches to the epidermis, where it's involving it and where it's not. Um, this is a squamous, invasive squamous cell carcinoma involving the skin. Um, if we go in a little further, we see like relatively the same degree of atypia that we were seeing in those in situ cases. Um, remember, there doesn't have to be like extreme atypia, but this looks like a well differentiated squamous cell carcinoma. Um, it's keratinizing. Okay, that's what all this pink stuff is. This is keratin. Um, lots of lymphocytic inflammation. And this is solar elastosis. I'm not sure this looks somewhat desmoplastic, but it's hard to tell. This is, whereas this is solar elastosis. So it's kind of nice having these side by side because you can see the solar elastosis is a little more robust, a little more broad, and this is a little more wispy. So squamous cell carcinoma, I'm sorry, top line would be your invasive squamous cell carcinoma, uh, well differentiated, probably should say characterizing. Um, that's what this is. This really just to me looks very desmoplastic, um, which is not surprising with this infiltrative border. But squamous cell carcinoma, K16. Okay, so we have some sort of hemorrhage going on, looks like at low power, lots of fat. And this looks like this is our superficial layer. So like I did in the previous case, whoops. No. We're just gonna rotate this, set our skins on top. And what I see right away is that this looks ulcerated. But let's take a closer look. So what we have here is our epidermis and we see that the epidermis is gone. So this is indeed, uh, ulcerated, um, doesn't look like maybe it's recent, but hopefully you are appreciating the atypia that's here. Um, this is not normal epidermis, okay? We have all these strands, hordes of uh, atypical epidermal cells that are just really haphazard. They're kind of going here, there, wherever, almost like it's creating this labyrinth of atypia within, within the skin itself. And you can see how some of these cells are binucleated, some of them are very large. We have lots of dyskeratotic cells, okay? Um, again, we're still producing keratin, but this doesn't look as nice as maybe the previous case. Again, just very infiltrative. So this is like a desmoplastic response within the stroma. Again, we have this inflammation, okay? And it looks a little more mixed, like maybe that's a plasma cell. Uh, these are definitely plasma cells over here, and we have lots of lymphocytes. 
you might have some macrophages in there too. Um, but again, this is invasive squamous carcinoma. It's my Tata figure there. Um, this, uh, so again, in, invasive keratinizing squamous cell carcinoma, comma, moderately differentiated. I feel like this is maybe somewhat poor, a little more poorly differentiated than our previous case. You can still tell that it's squamous cell, squamous cell um, but I don't think it's as nicely arranged as the previous case was. So I would call this moderately differentiated. And it is ulcerated, um, so you'd probably want to mention that too. Um, again, this is an excision, so they always want to know just how deep these lesions go from the normal epidermis, which can sometimes be difficult to measure when they're ulcerated, as well as distance to all your margins. Okay. Case 17, so what we know right away is that this case is very blue, both of them. And if we go in, let's just take a look at our epidermis. And our epidermis looks relatively happy. Um, there's some glycogenation, looks like some, some squame, <laughs> uh, keratin debris here. Um, but again, we're not thinking about SK because we have all these very intensely blue or purple cells. We have a little bit of palisading. And remember, palisading means when they line up along the edge of a lesion, almost like um, like peas in a pod or like picket fencing, there is some retraction artifact as well. Um, not really seeing like anything like the epidermal layer here is thinned, but I think it's still present. So not seeing any overt ulceration. Um, the cells themselves are relatively bland looking. Um, they are somewhat hyperchromatic. Some of them have nucleoli, but not all of them. Um, Anything else I can really talk to you guys about with this? Not so much. Um, let's see if we see other variants. This all looks the same pretty much. This is a really good area for like seeing the, the palisading and then everything in between. We don't have as much of the retraction artifact, um, but there are other areas that have the retraction artifact. So this is a basal cell carcinoma, nodular type. And I would not argue if someone wanted to say that this was like a combined nodular and infiltrating type. Um, but I think that what I wanted to show with this was like the predominant feature, which is the nodular type. Case 18, so it actually doesn't look like there's too much going on, so let's just go in. Oh, and we see it right away. So here is your normal epidermis. Which I don't think I really need to go off of this focus to get the, to show you what's going on with this. And here again, we have that peripheral palisading, um, not so much retraction artifact, but we can see that these are all basal type cells. If you want a little more, well, unfortunately, that's as high as we can go. But uh, again, these relatively bland nuclei, uh, again, not really prom like inconspicuous nucleoli. The cytoplasm itself is somewhat eosinophilic, uh, not as prominent as your uh, squamous cells up here within your normal epidermis. And what we see is that Really, this is confined to like that superficial dermis. And I think regardless of where we look, here's some inflammation within the dermis. This lesion is confined to that very superficial papillary dermis. There's an area of, of retraction. Um, so this is again, basal cell carcinoma, but this is known as the superficial type. And we can appreciate why. This is case 19. 
So again, we can see that there's something going on within the dermis. It looks very eosinophilic, which um, is part of the staining of this case. Uh, this isn't what you normally see with the lesion. Again, we have peripheral palisading. Okay, so that's something that helps you. There's a little bit of this mixoid or um, mucinous, eh, mixoid I think is a better way to describe it, mixoid change to the stroma, like right around the lesion. So remember, we can see that you don't necessarily have to have the retraction artifact. It just helps you differentiate from some other lesions. Um, and these, again, are very bland looking cells, um, inconspicuous nucleoli, like maybe there's a couple of them in there, um, but they're relatively bland. Uh, yes, the, the cytoplasm is eosinophilic, but again, I think there's something funny going on with the stain. Um, but all the other features are present. You just would expect this to be more blue. <laughs> uh, and unfortunately it's not, but that's one of, one of the reasons why I like having these cases in the challenge cases, just that you kind of appreciate the morphology and everything more because stains can also differ from place to place. Um, but again, very uh, somewhat nodular. Okay, so again, I, if someone told me this was a mixed type, I would not argue with them. What I really wanted to show uh, with this one was more of like the infiltrative type areas. Let's see on the other piece. So again, how you kind of have like these strings going out uh, into the dermis. And again, that that mixoid type change to the stroma. Um, so again, this is a basal cell carcinoma. Mm, that looks like keratin though. Maybe I need to spend a little more time on this one. And maybe it's just weirding me out, but everything else really looks like a basal cell carcinoma. Um, there are nodular areas for sure. Um, but there's also infiltrating types. And, and uh, from my experience, my very limited experience with basal cell carcinomas is that often you see these, these combinations, and I would say uh, nodular and infiltrating are probably the two that I see most often, and usually in some sort of combination. But we'll see, we might amend and change our views on this one. Um, but it would be highly unusual for like a squamous cell carcinoma to have this kind of palisading. Um, when you think about your, your other differentials like your uh, tricholamomas and, and stuff like that, um, they can have uh, the palisading and stuff like that as well. This is definitely not Merkel. It doesn't look sebaceous. So maybe it's just the funny staining that's throwing me off. But um, yeah, so this one is a challenge to me too. Case 19 is, is not, not been too fun. Case 20. Um, So again, here is our epidermis and we're in the dermis here. We're actually approaching deep dermis with this and subcutis looks like it's involved too. So, oh, is it? okay. So again, we have peripheral palisading. But it kind of has like this this different look to it, like the nuclei look almost vacuolated, um, but still very basophilic. Uh, here we have the retraction arc artifact, and 
the cystic areas. I'd really like to see with this though, uh, do we have areas that look like they have more keratin? And maybe that's what we were seeing on the previous case and just the eosinophilia was really throwing me off. Um, but again, like this is, this is a basal cell carcinoma as well. The cystic spaces kind of all look empty though, which is a little on the frustrating side. Um, whoops, let me knock this out. Um, here we have some squame. It looks like some multinucleated giant cells. <laughs> Let's see if the other pieces have anything. But this very infiltrative look to it. The other possibility is that I somehow switch slides around because this one to me looks better for infiltrative. There's some keratin, maybe. Looks more like collagen. I think that's collagen. Uh, <laughs> so what I'm looking for with this is, um, well, I think we can all agree that this this is a basal cell carcinoma. This looks infiltrative. Um, but what I was hoping to show you was inf infundi in fundibulocystic type, uh, which does have keratin. So I wonder if I had switched slides around. Because um, this really looks much better for infiltrative type. We have one, actually a couple more pieces. So let's just see. Again, this looks like collagen in here. Oh, whoops. There we go. There's some, some keratin. Um, and again, like I said, a lot of these cases, they are, oh, here we go. This looks much better. Uh, well, maybe not, maybe not. No. <laughs> uh, is it gonna load? Sometimes they uh, it takes a little bit for the slides to load up higher. Um, but honestly, looking at this, I would want to call this more infundibulocystic, or sorry, infiltrative and the previous one more infundibulocystic type. Let's go to case 21 and see there. Okay, so what we have here is here's your epidermis. This is detached. Um, uh -huh. Okay, so what we have here is again, uh, epidermis, so we're coming down. And again, we notice that you have the peripheral palisading, not so much retraction artifact, which is actually really like a caveat with this type, um, as well as like instead of involving like the superficial dermis, this, this type of basal cell carcinoma really likes to go um, more. Uh, it can involve the superficial dermis, but it likes to be in the reticular dermis. Um, and it's characterized by these extremely small nodules that may or may not have a traction artifact. Like maybe there's a little bit here, um, but as you can see with most of this, there's not. Um, so this is the micronodular variant of uh, basal cell carcinoma. Um, and this is one of the relatively aggressive subtypes. Infiltrative is also aggressive. Micronodular uh, is aggressive. Um, so these are subtypes that you want to take care of. So what we're going to do is 
So that's what we have for today for our challenge cases. Let's just see on the next slide. Okay, so I think I uh, had switched these around. So I will fix that and um, maybe record these two. Um, but I really feel that like 19 looked a little more infundibulocystic type and 20 looked a little more infiltrating. So what we're gonna do, just kinda break up things, is I'm gonna go back to 19. Because I think like this is really basal, but this looks like keratin. And this is keratin within a cyst. Um, so I think at some point, again, more keratin, uh, those two subtypes were switched. So I will amend this right away. Um, and so in the video, um, I will also change what we're talking about there. So that's a little more congruent because um, this definitely fits far more into infiltrative, I think. It has features that look like uh, infundibulocystic type as well, um, but I think this really looks better for uh, infiltrative and the previous looks better for infundibulocystic. Um, so I think we'll just switch those cases around and we'll add uh, a note into, into everything so that anyone who saw that before uh, will understand what's going on. Um, that's okay, because uh, this is how we learn. I still think the staining is funny on this case though, so, um, but that's what we have for this week. Uh, so if this was helpful, if you, thought that there was things that could have been improved other than me switching the two cases to where they make more sense. Um, please let me know. If uh, you like this video, please hit like. If you aren't subscribed to us, please hit the subscribe button, which should have shown up by now on the video. And we will see you next week with another slide review and hopefully with another video on more challenge cases.